Good evening, and welcome to Argonne National Laboratory's virtual out loud lecture. I'm Leslie Crone, Argonne's Chief Communications Officer, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined this forum. It's my role to begin with some housekeeping remarks to help you all get the most out of today's lecture. First, please be aware that this lecture is being recorded, and by participating in the event, you are consenting to the recording. Second, I'd like to talk a little bit about technology. We're using the BlueJeans platform for this virtual event. It works best in the Chrome browser. So if you have connected using another browser, you may want to exit and reconnect with Chrome. Your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined the meeting. If you're logged in via the web or the app, you should be able to see our presentation. Right now, you should be seeing a slide that says, welcome with my name. To optimize the experience for everyone and keep bandwidth requirements to your homes low, we have eliminated all video. Again, we will be sharing slides and you'll hear our speakers, but you will not see the speakers. If you have questions related to the technology of the meeting, for instance, if you can't hear what we're saying, please use the moderator chat feature and we will help you troubleshoot. Next, we do want to hear from you. So there will be a Q&A session after this evening's main presentations. To ask questions, please use the Q&A function. You can submit your questions at any time. If you wanna ask a question, but someone has already submitted it, you can like the question so that we know it is important to more people. Look for the square Q&A at the right of your screen. It should be the fourth gray icon down from the top. Lastly, Argonne's Out Loud Lecture Series is one way we share some of our most interesting science stories and the discoveries that impact our lives and our world. The lectures address a diverse range of topics. This evening's lecture is on Argonne's contribution to the field of cybersecurity. Regretfully, our lab director, Paul Kearns, was unable to join us this evening. So it is my pleasure to introduce the Chief Information Officer of Argonne's business, Du Hene. Du. Thanks, thanks, Leslie. Um, yeah, again, a, a welcome to everybody um, joining us here at this uh, virtual out loud lecture um, and hearing a little bit, a bit about some of the programs that we're doing here uh, with uh, cybersecurity. As Leslie said, I'm the Chief Information Officer you're responsible for all uh, operational technology here at the lab. So since Argonne's beginnings, you know, almost 75 years ago, um, you know, we've unlocked new science frontiers and solved big, complex uh, problems for the country. Um, an important mission of all of the national labs is to, to secure America's energy future and economic growth. And this includes protecting our critical digital resources from ever evolving cyber attacks. Confronting existing th threats from hackers, both foreign and domestic, is critical to defending our online infrastructure. You know, this is an infrastructure that now includes everything from our energy grids, our power grids, uh, and the systems we are increasingly relying upon for teleworking um, during this, uh, this pandemic. At Argonne, we've got a number of long running and emerging uh, research and operational cybersecurity programs. These are led by some of the nation's leading researchers in both cybersecurity and systems. In Tonight, we're fortunate to hear from two of our researchers leading examples of this groundbreaking work. Firstly, you'll hear from uh, Scott Pinkerton, who's the program lead for cyber threat sharing, and he'll discuss how his team is researching a holistic, comprehensive approach to cybersecurity. Scott's team develops and implements machine-to-machine -machine information sharing tools that quickly disseminate cyber threat information. They're also developing techniques to, in order to improve cyber situational awareness, which is very much needed in our increasingly digital and interconnected world. Their work aims to help public-private uh, public partnerships and counter malicious cyber activities that threatens a nation's infrastructure, for example, as I said, the, the electric grid and transportation systems, major infrastructure that all of us depend upon, upon our daily lives. Secondly, you'll hear from uh, Roland Variali, a cyber security analyst who's going to talk about how his team is applying cyber security strategies to a specific challenge. 
Roland's multidisciplinary team is studying cyber vulnerability in cars with smart features. The idea that vehicles in motion are susceptible to a hacker takeover is a stark example of the example of havoc your hackers can cause. Roland's research aims to understand and help pre prevent these risks. Roland and his colleagues are using physical and simulated test sites to gauge the risk of cyber attacks on vehicles and mitigate future cyber attacks. He's also looking at ways that new vehicle technologies are integrated with the existing system. You will see during this presentation that Scott and Rowland's research is connected and dependent on each other. They combine many different science fields that bring together industry, academia, and government. They solve big real-world challenges with Algon's state-of-the-art user facilities and a world-class community of talent that are only available at our national lab. Again, thank you for being here virtually this evening. Scott, I'll hand it to you to start tonight's program. Thank you, Stu, and hello to everyone who has joined us virtually this evening. I'm happy to be here. Tonight's topic is certainly one that is near and dear to me. I can still remember back to about 1986 using dial-up modems and tools like Gopher, the precursor to Google and search as we know it today, to help find information on this emerging thing now casually called the internet. Next slide, please. Tonight, we will be talking about several societal shifts that have occurred as the internet and the dizzying array of network applications have evolved. We will also be looking at the internet and cybersecurity interdependence. These two topics have been inexorably linked almost from its inception. This early relationship is captivatingly told in the book, The Cuckoo's Egg, tracking a spy through a maze of computer espionage. It's a truly amazing how a 75 cent billing error began such a journey into the world of cybersecurity. Today, we are all living in a digital age, one where digital or cyber technology has permeated all throughout our lives. For Argonne National Laboratory, we have long been focused on the cyber risks associated with the research we do locally at the laboratory, and additionally with our nation's critical infrastructure. This research is constantly evolving, just like the internet and how we use it is constantly evolving. Few of us would have guessed that the country and the world even would be relying on the internet as we are today during this time of global pandemic. Next slide, please. The mind-boggling advances in both computer and data networking, along with creative software development, enables all of us to gather here tonight, and it supplements our daily lives in ways we could not have dreamed of before. Speaking as someone who over the decades has enjoyed music albums, yes, even 45 records, eight track tapes, cassette tapes, CDs, and now streaming music, the internet today offers an unbelievable array of capabilities. But with that wonder, there are also lots of challenges that have come along with these technological advances. In many ways, we have sacrificed significant aspects of our personal privacy for the convenience and enjoyment that today's digital world has to offer. Sadly, it is difficult for many of us to truly appreciate how interconnected our digital lives are and what the ripple effect of that can look like through the lens of cyber threats. These threats can manifest themselves in both our personal and professional lives and in the foundations of our society when we consider threats to our critical infrastructure. During tonight's talk, we will focus primarily on energy and vehicle mobility issues. Next slide, please. The concept of cybersecurity is seemingly so simple. Let the good guys in, keep the bad guys out, and keep the wheels turning, whether that is in a personal, professional, or societal context. 
However, many of the ways that we traditionally think about cybersecurity are rooted in the paradigm of a castle with a moat and a drawbridge. Alas, today's world is one where the notion of borders are rapidly disappearing. This is true both in the nature of our personal and our work life, but also in the context of nations, as we are all adjusting to the reality of living in a time of global pandemic, organizations are quickly having to reimagine the concept of the corporate network and establish new ways to protect it. With the increasing use of cloud computing, it becomes even more difficult to know where our data lives or is stored and what legal protections the data associated with our lives can or should have. Back in the day, if someone wanted to rob the bank or steal your car, they would have to come physically to your location. The concept of proximity had real meaning. In today's digital world, data and cyber threats are moving at a fraction of the speed of light. Today's digital robber can just as easily be on another continent and the time it takes for something very bad to happen can be small, sometimes in the seemingly blink of an eye. Next slide, please. As stated by the World Economic Forum, cyber crime is one of the greatest risks to prosperity in the fourth industrial revolution. Nation state cyber activities tend to garner most international attention but in fact, cyber criminals are responsible for the majority of malicious cyber activity, about 80% by some estimates. In addition to direct damages, which are projected to cost the global economy about $6 trillion or 6.3% annually by 2021, cyber crime is a colossal barrier to digital trust. It drastically undermines the benefits of cyberspace and hinders international cyber stability efforts. And according to Interpol, the deployment of data harvesting malware by cyber criminals is on the rise. Using COVID-19 related information as a lure, threat actors infiltrate systems to compromise networks, steal data, divert money and build botnets. When it comes to the intersection of the cyber physical world, attacks can be devastating. Ransomware attacks have been on the rise and the healthcare industries are increasingly being targeted. This ransomware attack shown on the slide was certainly an extreme case of the cyber physical intersection. But attacks against critical intersect infrastructure and the energy sector specifically are particularly worrisome. The consequences of cyber attacks there can be devastating. Next slide, please. We wanted a world with a strong castle to protect us, but we are finding out that at best, we might only have a picket fence. Network borders are deteriorating, much like the boundary between our personal and professional lives are. When you suddenly wake up in a global pandemic and seemingly overnight, a significant percentage of the world's workforce is suddenly working from home, the erosion of borders is increasing at an alarming pace. When we believed in a network border, we could leverage that concept to help create trust while establishing our personal digital identity and the associated attributes of that identity in cyberspace. My digital identity personally has bank accounts and also personal data. My professional digital identity has authorities in a corporate context, and it allows me to access corporate data and other intellectual property. All of these elements can be of value to cyber criminals. This rapid transition 
to working from home is creating enormous challenges for the cyber defenders and law enforcement agencies that strive to protect us every single day. Next slide, please. When it comes to corporate cyber defense, or even in our personal digital lives, we are constantly in a loop evaluating what is new or different and assessing if it is threatening or not. Combine the fact that we have picket fence type borders and the reality that today's businesses have people accessing the corporate networks using a mix of both personal and corporate devices, it should not come as a surprise that cyber defenders stay in a constant cycle of looking for the deviations in network behavior, looking for the needle in the haystack of what is suspicious versus just network noise, and then evaluating if those things are indeed malicious to our computers, our data, or not. In our physical world, numerous studies have shown that our brains have become highly evolved over the ages to assist us in fight or flight decisions and response. However, our digital world is a mere 50 years old and in an almost constant state of evolution. Some might even call revolution. In this environment, Cyber defenders are in a desperate race to develop new ways to assess, comprehend, and respond to cyber events as quickly as possible. Cyber threat assessment is no longer an activity that can be performed at the pace of comparing calendars and scheduling a meeting to review the new developments. Rather, it requires a radically different, a digital approach that can facilitate machine speed responses. To that end, since about 2004, my primary research area has focused on machine-to-machine -machine communication and information sharing in the context of cybersecurity. Next slide, please. Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Between 2003 and 2005, there was a young Swede, just 16 years old at the time, who went by the alias of Staccato, that perpetrated a number of cyber attacks, including some here at Argonne. These attacks exploited trust relationships that existed between Argonne and the University of Illinois. It was these events that led us to begin developing development of something now known as the cyber fed model which enables the machine to machine exchange of cyber threat information this started as an automated information exchange within the department of energy's office of science and then later expanded to encompass all of the department of energy as an entity within the Department of Energy detected a network-based threat that they individually thought it warranted blocking or dropping the network traffic, then that information was rapidly distributed across the department using machine-to-machine -machine information sharing techniques in a way that could also be integrated into perimeter protection systems to provide automatic defense at other sites. This concept casually known as local detection and global protection. This early work required the development of numerous unique software capabilities, but it also highlighted the almost bigger challenge of extending trust within the digital world. These initial efforts involved once evolved once again in 2015 with the signing of the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015. 90 days after that legislation was signed, Argonne and the Department of Energy became the first federal entity to share cyber threat data with the new automated indicator sharing system that was implemented by the Department of Homeland Security. 
The cyber fed model system also provides machine to machine information sharing capabilities within the US energy sector. All of these capabilities are still focused on what are the new threats being seen right now on our computers, our phones, and with our, within our nation's critical infrastructure. Next slide, please. Once we know what is bad or malicious on our networks, today we have numerous technology options that can help us distribute that information across this trust community very rapidly. The next challenge that we are now focusing on is how can we determine what is malicious or not as fast as we can? Rapid situational awareness. We are pivoting from machine to machine sharing as our emphasis, and instead we are working on ways to leverage machine to machine communication in new ways to enable us to rapidly collect and then analyze diverse cyber data sets to help us determine what is malicious and what is not. Again, we have been finding that this is not exclusively a technology problem. The notion of digital trust continues to play a significant role in developing new and novel solutions. The information that one entity is willing to share with an, another entity, even for the noble purpose of assessing cyber threats, will often depend on who is asking, both in terms of what company and what, what the person or role within that company is, and also what they're asking about. I have likened this problem of understanding cyber threats to one of doing a million piece puzzle where your organization only has maybe 2,000 pieces. To see the bigger picture of cyber threat, we must quickly obtain more data elements to help us create a rapid cyber situational awareness. Next slide, please. As you heard in the previous Argonne Out Loud series, Rick Stevens spoke about accelerating therapeutic development for COVID-19 and specifically how artificial intelligence and supercomputing are reducing the time required for drug development. In that scientific area, the publicly available information in the various chemical library databases have been instrumental to the research and are helping to drastically reduce the normal timelines for drug development. The techniques that we are now researching for creating rapid cyber situational awareness possibly have applicability in the development of future artificial intelligence systems, especially with machine learning where the data sets are not publicly available and the acquisition of focused and possibly sensitive data sets to two to train new AI algorithms while leveraging adaptive trust principles. What data I share depends on who asks and might, en might enable breakthroughs in yet new scientific disciplines as well. With that, I'd like to pass the talk over to my colleague, Roland Variali. Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. I'm Roland Variali, and I'm a cybersecurity analyst at Argonne National Laboratory. I'll be discussing some of the cybersecurity research we perform on transportation-related systems. Next slide, please. When we talk about cybersecurity systems, it's important to understand that they are complex. To properly secure a system, you need to understand how it is intended to be used and why each component is there. This can become very difficult when we consider which devices are included and how people need to use them. We don't immediately think of people as a part of security, but people are both our biggest asset and our biggest liability within security. You can think of these complex systems like mechanical watches with hundreds of tiny moving parts. The gears that make up how the minute's hand work are interdependent on the gears that make the second's hand move and so forth. 
When we approach securing systems, we need to understand how and why each of the gears are there to ensure that the whole system works at the end. In this interconnected world, we need to consider not only the things within an organization's network, but everything that interacts with them as well. This includes secure remote connections that you may be familiar with, like VPNs. Your job may require you to use VPNs at work and using software such as Cisco AnyConnect, TeamViewer, Windows Remote Desktop. Or you may be familiar with using secure web browsing protocols like HTTPS that are managed by your web browser. We need to ensure that every single device that interacts within an organization is properly vetted to ensure that they have access to what they need. Any weakness within a system yields an opportunity for an attacker to perform some unwanted action. Within organizations, there are individual systems that comprise the organization. This includes lots of business functions that keep everything running smoothly, like finance, IT, legal, and marketing. We need to consider all of the different communications that happen within the walls of the system to ensure that we are keeping the good people inside the walls and the bad people outside the walls, as Scott previously said. This also in includes ensuring that the good individuals don't have access to too many resources. For example, Sarah from Legal may not need to access customer data that Rob from Marketing needs. Although we trust our employees, we need technical measures in place to ensure they only access necessary items. When systems become more complex, we sometimes forget about access that we gave an employee and the access can creep over time. Along with applying general cybersecurity principles, Argonne has extensive background in creating, implementing, and securing industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are large pieces of machinery that provide functionality within our nation's infrastructure. Cranes, electric plants, water treatment plants, and in our case, electric vehicle charging infrastructure are some examples. These systems typically use older technologies and protocols, which are ways devices communicate with each other. Securing them can sometimes be more difficult because they don't support some of the more modern technologies and solutions. This means we need to come up with tricky ways of adding them to, our, to an organization to ensure both the industrial control system and the organization stay secure. Next slide, please. In this slide, we see the vehicle to everything or mobility landscape where we have interactions between different transportation systems. You can see the importance of securing both the individual systems as well as the systems they participate within. We can chain different systems together to form an even more complex system. You can imagine that the more moving parts we add to these systems, the more difficult they are to secure. We also consider some of the different ways each of the systems communicate, through the internet, using cellu cellular networks, or even using satellites. Each type of technology that is added to a system presents opportunity for a weakness. As we add functionality to devices, we need to ensure that proper security follows in order to limit negative, thing, negative things like unauthorized access. This can become unwieldy at a rapid pace. We see different technologies being added to vehicles such as OnStar cellular, Bluetooth radio, wireless network connectivity, and over-the-air software updates. Each of these technologies comes with risks that need to be considered and addressed. We see this trend within charging infrastructure as well, using internet or cellular networks to process transactions, using radio frequency key fobs to take care of payments, and using cell phone apps to register and record payment information. We need to ensure that all the different individual systems within the larger system are secure. For example, if an attacker had physical access to a vehicle charging stations, how could they use it for personal gain? Could they create a small surreptitious card skimming piece of software and install it late at night? Could they analyze the network connections to identify possible financial transaction servers? Sometimes the complexity of the system integrations can become unmanageable and having third party analysis can offer insights that were initially overlooked. Systems tend to become more chaotic when they develop over time. These technologies are rapidly integrated and sometimes the security implementation lags. This is where we see vulnerabilities emerge. Next slide, please. 
Vehicles use internal networks that lack authentication and authorization. Most cars contain older versions of this network, which lacks some of the retrofitted security features and allows for broadcast communication only. Fortunately, critical systems like the battery management system are difficult to compromise, which makes extraordinary actions like exploding batteries very difficult, if not impossible. You may be familiar with the G-Pack by Dr. Charlie Miller and Chris Balasek, where they took control of a Jeep going at highway speed. They used the vehicle's infotainment unit to send signals over the vehicle's internal network. We're looking at adding artificial intelligence approaches and creating logical groups of signals to gain a deeper understanding of why a signal may be sending different information than we expect. For example, when we make a right-hand turn, we expect the wheels to turn at the same angle and the steering wheel to rotate. But if one of those things isn't happening, something may be amiss. Correlating these signals makes attacks on the vehicle's internal network much more difficult. Within the vehicle themselves, we look at the relatively insecure way that vehicles communicate, but we are most interested in how vehicles participate within larger transportation systems. For example, can I change signals within my vehicle to trick other vehicles, infrastructure, or other parts of transportation systems? Along with the vehicles themselves, roadside infrastructure participates in mobility systems by providing information for vehicles that may indicate safety concerns, road conditions, or other notable events. Similar to the signs you see on the side of the road right now, but using a much more time-sensitive information sharing method, similar to the one Scott described with machine-to-machine -machine threat sharing. The trust between vehicles and infrastructure creates an area of consideration for both attackers and defenders. Consider someone interacting with roadside infrastructure using their laptop or mobile device. There are downstream effects on the other roadside units within the network, as well as with cars passing by. The trust decisions between these actors and the environment needs to happen almost instantly. This time restriction limits the types of solutions you can implement in a real-time system. Vehicle charging infrastructure is the most rapidly changing frontier within the mobility security space. Charging station infrastructure contains a mix of traditional IT, like networking and smaller versions of Windows, but also operational technologies that control the actual power distribution portion of the device. Since the IT system often has a program which manages the power distribution, an operator can often manipulate the power system by using a high-level programming language or a graphical user interface. This is convenient for the developers, but also for the attackers since you do not need to understand the rules of the underlying industrial control system protocols. Sometimes you can simply click the button that says stop charger. Finally, we are very concerned with the possible risks and consequences to the grid that may cause disruptions. Current Department of Energy Research has partnered Argonne with Sandia National Laboratories and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to focus on disruptions to the grid through vehicle ch charging and station compromise. However, we have not found a strong correlation at the current amount of power supplied to the charging stations. This is not to say that it should not be a concern of ours, but just that the current technology does not have the capability to cause widespread grid disruption. This is an area where leveraging our interdisciplinary subject matter expertise allows us to make educated decisions on how complex systems will behave amidst the cyber attack. These systems provide some type of attacks prevent some types of attacks from occurring based on their physical implementations. By combining our knowledge of cyber attacks with possible mitigations built into these systems, we can provide a more realistic model that demonstrates the consequences of these attacks on the targeted systems. We often look at some specific types of networks within this space. I have de described the vehicle to infrastructure environment and how roadside units can provide information to vehicles but vehicles can also provide information to other vehicles, creating vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle networks. This allows for real-time sharing of driving information that can assist in situations like lane merging and can promote actions like platooning, which is when vehicles drive very closely behind each other at high speeds, which you can imagine requires high levels of trust and rapid information sharing. In a case like this, we need to ensure that both the individual systems and the overall mobility systems have the proper security and trust checks in place to avoid catastrophic events. Next slide, please. 
A recent development is the integration of charging infrastructure within building energy management systems. Building energy management systems provide automation, logging, and control over power usage and distribution throughout a building or group of buildings. They're most commonly seen within shopping malls and office spaces and provide a nexus between charging infrastructure and the electric grid. You can set up specific conditions and alarms to try and avoid safety issues like overloading circuits or set it up to alter power distribution based on trends that you identify. One, one example of this is at the Argonne Smart Plaza where they modify the amount of prioritized power to the office space during working hours, but can focus on the vehicle charging stations outside during times of low office usage. You can also perform actions to control how you use or sell energy from solar canopies or other energy generating sources. Building energy management systems are also integrated within automation systems, which include things like security systems and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, HVAC systems. However, because this example links together so many systems, vehicles, charging stations, building energy management systems, and now automation systems, we have a very complex system. The people that install the building energy management systems often differ from the people who install the other systems, such as the charging infrastructure. And we see a lot of variety in how these systems are deployed. This makes security very difficult because there isn't a pre prescriptive solution to offer. To alleviate this, we need to confer with many different manufacturers and understand how and why their technologies are incorporated. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, we have had limited access to our charging infrastructure during this pandemic, but fortunately, we can focus on the possible remote attacks. To do this, we look at the different pieces of hardware and software running within the system and look at ways that attackers might try and interact with them. Can we limit the availability of a service by sending lots of website requests? Can we use a weakness in a piece of software that wasn't upgraded? Argonne has subject matter experts that confer, evaluate, and create solutions to these complex problems. Creating cybersecurity solutions in a vacuum is myopic and usually does not solve larger infrastructural problems like a Band-Aid. At the Argonne Smart Plaza, there are experts designing power distribution systems, vehicle systems, and other energy sciences. Understanding their viewpoints on system design gives valuable insight into how we need to secure them. We cannot simply design security without considering how each of the parts needs to be used, or else we may eliminate functionality that is required by a different part of the system. In our watch analogy, if you fasten one of the gears on the second sand, there are downstream effects that we need to consider, namely in how the minutes hand and hour hands work. Next slide, please. This interdisciplinary approach also takes into account our partnerships with private companies that are developing the technologies. Charging system manufacturers have short development times and try to get technology to market as quickly as possible. Sometimes the experts in these systems only consider a subset of the possible security weaknesses, and we can offer insight into how additional security measures can be integrated while preserving the operations of the stations. This creates a feedback loop where manufacturers give us information on the technical implementation and underlying logic, and we can offer ways that attackers would interact with it to try and subvert the system. This allows manufacturers to integrate security more proactively into their development process instead of by reacting to events. We also try to understand how certain protocols or communication methods are used within the overall scheme of the system. Do we truly need to use an insecure protocol or have more secure alternatives been developed since the initial construction of the system? Having researchers intimately familiar with each protocol allows for a better understanding of how to evaluate these types of decisions. Next slide, please. We also look to solve problems for emerging technologies and problems that may not be relevant yet. As we rapidly deploy technologies, we are incorporating our findings and disseminating them to the companies producing the infrastructure in use. When we share our research with manufacturers, it allows for better understanding of the associated cyber risks and allows the vehicle security community to address problems more proactively. One of our main areas of focus is on how new technologies are added within the space and how that may disrupt our current infrastructure deployments. 
Building energy management systems are rapidly adding smart features, including Internet of Things devices like webcams. How can we appropriately secure them to make sure our systems work as intended? When we continue using older protocols, can we do so over encrypted communication channels like VPN, which may make intercepting that traffic less useful? What are the risks to our grid when we deploy new, rapidly developing charging infrastructure? We are looking into solutions to these problems so that we have answers when these attacks become relevant. This includes keeping up with cutting edge technologies and how the industry is moving. We leverage our relationships with private industry, which are so fruitful for us. We can understand what the current state is and where it's going, which allows us to make better judgments on how the industry is evolving. And now Leslie will lead the question and answer portion of the event. Well, thanks very much, both Scott and Roland, for sharing your important research with us. Now it's time to hear from you, our virtual audience. So again, to ask a question, use the Q&A function that is on the right side of your screen. Look for the square with the Q&A on, on the right. It should be the fourth gray icon down from the top. So there are several questions already in the queue, um, and many of you have found the like button. Um, I encourage you to do that because that helps us know what is important to everyone. We will try our best to get to as many questions as we can, but we've got over 300 folks on the line. We may not be able to get to them all. Um, so with that, I am going to send our first question over to Scott. Um, and the question is, could you please offer a brief overview of the Internet of Things and talk about what security challenges that concept would bring uh, with widespread use? Sure, Leslie, thank you very much. The Internet of Things and the companion to that, the industrial Internet of Things, I would describe simply as a trend of adding network connectivity to a wide variety of devices, uh, devices ranging anywhere from doorbells, refrigerators, even our coffee pots, uh, adding this extra, uh, sometimes it might be considered a bolt-on of network connectivity to these traditionally non-smart devices. Um, I think is loosely the uh, the concept of the Internet of Things. In the industrial side, this usually implies adding network connectivity to elements within the industrial control systems or within factories. There are a wide range of security challenges with these devices. These devices are typically much more difficult to monitor. Uh, you, it's diff more difficult to get logging information or uh, keep track of what, process, what software processes are running inside of them. And they have been shown to have a number of security weaknesses. Some of these devices have been co-opted for malicious purposes. You hear about people breaking in and, and talking uh, on webcam, nanny cams, things like that. Uh, the level of the growing concern in this area, I think is best reflected uh, by some of the new executive orders aimed at protecting our bulk power system. Uh, this, uh, it is starting to get a lot more attention uh, for the, the potential for security risks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. All right, I'm going to tackle some of these that are really about personal IT safety and security. So, Stu, um, first question is going to go over to you, and the question is, does changing passwords often really lead to better security? Yeah, good uh, good question. And, uh, you know, it's annoying to change passwords. Uh, I know, as a, you know I do that myself, but a good way to think about it, it's a bit like, um, you know, if you lost your keys, you might decide to change your to change your lock. So it's kind of like that, except that you may not know that you've lost your password because somebody may have, have uh, you know, stolen it from a site and you may not, may not find out. So it is a good idea to change passwords fairly regularly. And apart from changing them, it's important not to have them all the same, especially not the same, um, you know, don't have the same password for your banking as you might use for, for Netflix or something like that. Thanks, Leslie. 
Okay, good advice. All right. Um, Roland, there's a question in here uh, for you. Uh, should we assume that video conference software like Zoom or Google Hangouts are safe to use, or should they be worried about what data is being transferred when the applications are used? Whenever we're using a third party service, we should always be skeptical of the connections that are being used and the encryption being used. Um, I am of the belief that I, I don't transmit things from my computer that I don't think would be looked at at some point or intercepted. So when you use things like encrypted communication, if that's intercepted, people can see the jarbled message that's there. So I would be um, extra vigilant about doing your homework and looking at the different offerings of video conferencing software and the different capabilities of them and ensuring they meet uh, your comfort level with ability to protect the information you're sending from your computer. Great, thanks. Um, Stu, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, similar question again about antivirus and anti-malware programs that, you know, and whether they are providing significant protection for personal devices. Yep, that the answer is a definite yes. Um, you know, antivirus, firewall, all of those, um, having those installed on, on your machines is definitely worthwhile. Um, you know, a lot of cases, much like Scott's talk there, these programs are sharing threat information, so you've got, you know, very up-to-date um, defenses against some of this stuff. But it's important to remember, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, it comes down to, to what you're doing. You're the last line of defense. So you want to make sure that you know, you're not clicking on links that are coming from remote email addresses or um, you're not paying attention. Thanks, Leslie. All right. Yeah, sure. I'm going to come right back to you, though, Stu. So a question out here. Argon uh, has, has data in the cloud, but what can you tell the audience about whether cloud data storage, uh, the safety of that? So um, continuing on from, from what Roland was, meant, was mentioning, you know, it's really important that you know, whoever is providing you the storage in the cloud, that you read their terms and you're happy with um, with the way that you're treating your that they're treating your data, whether they're using encryption and whether they've got some privacy rules and things. Um, most of the major providers, if you're using the cloud, um, will offer you know the ability to have what we call two-factor authentication. So that means that you've got more than just a password. So you have a password, and then perhaps they text you a, a code to your mobile phone. Perhaps you've got um, you know, an application on your phone that gives you a, a second code. And that's, you know, that's an extra layer of protection, you know, to make sure that even if you do lose your password, that folks can't get uh, access to what you may have stored in a cloud. Great. All right, Scott, I'm coming back to you. Question is, how does quantum computing's development impact cybersecurity? Well, um, quantum computing and to some degree the the promises you know that all of us hear in the in the news uh, about being unhackable and things like that are of of great interest uh, especially in the nation state context but uh, and the reason it's it's somewhat so timely right now is this uh, the lead time, the development time around this sort of technology is still fairly considerable. Uh, actually, Argon had was recently in the news uh, doing great things with uh, sort of quantum uh, computing development. So we are actively engaged in that area. Uh, and so I'll, I'll say it's a, an area of intense uh, research, both on how to develop the, the regular capabilities and then also to assess these new and emerging capabilities for uh, cyber vulnerabilities and risks, and then work to develop solutions for them. So it's a very active area uh, right this second, even though that technology is still years off. Okay. Uh, Roland, I think this one builds off of your your talk about vehicles and transportation. So, 
you mentioned that for a number of future technologies, for instance, platooning self-driving cars, immense trust would be needed. What kind of technological advances could we expect if one could prevent physical attacks on hardware? Um, so a, a lot of the advances in this field um, are in computer vision, AI and machine learning with processing the environment, and then building trust relationships within the vehicle and using reputation-based systems to judge, have I seen this car before? Should I trust this car before? Have I never seen this car before? Um, and metrics like that. So it, it's about um, creating the, the reality for the vehicle and understanding what environment it's operating in. Because right now the vehicle operates kind of independently of the road. Your car that you have from 1998 doesn't know what road it's on or anything like that. You tell it to steer and it steers. Um, so smart cars become more aware of their environment and more contextually aware. Okay. Um, Stu, I'm coming back to you with a question about AI in a cybersecurity context. How is AI being used by both hackers and their targets? So um, on the on the uh, target side of thing, there's quite a lot of. In fact, some of the um, antivirus programs have some AI in them these days. So it's it's learning from you know what's normal, um, what normally happens on your computer, and and spotting anomalies. Um, so there's there's certainly already you know a footprint for that, and that's only changing. Um, with every release of this this kind of software, from a from a hacker point of view, the thing the thing to think about here is that an AI, at the end of the day, is is something that can that can do things at a orders of magnitude quicker than a person. So the threat there is is that you know perhaps they're trying to guess your password based on all sorts of information that they may be able to find from you, um, you know on on public. Uh, Web pages and things like that, Facebook profiles and and whatnot. So that's the that's the best way to think about you know AI on both sides. Thanks. Um, I'm going to again do come to you um, and maybe Scott, you would want to weigh in as well. Um, so given the current situation with COVID and the increasing reliance on cyber infrastructure, do you believe the frequency of cyber attacks will rise during this time? And we'll start with that question. Stu. Yeah, and um, so I don't need to believe it. I, I saw it in real time. As we, as we started to go to telework, which seems like forever ago now, but in the, in the kind of March timeframe, um, the, uh, cyber defenses at, at Argonne, we saw an increase um, in attempts on both uh, our VPN and um, the number of spam emails and phishing attempts and things like that that they came into into the lab. So definitely saw saw an increase. Um, more broadly, Scott, maybe you can answer answer that. Scott. Are you there? Yep, forgot to turn, unmute my mic. My apology. Stu, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, I, just the regular news is certainly full of increasing uh, numbers of stories to hospital systems, uh, whether or not it's ransomware oriented or others. We are really seeing uh, there's such national interest in the COVID situation that creates an opportunity to get even more people to sometimes click on a link or open an attachment that otherwise they might not do. And so it it really ups our uh, the potential for bad things. The, uh, the second half of that question, you know, the future of cybersecurity looking like, um, you know, boy, constant flux. Uh, you know, this is such a cat and mouse game to uh, try and adapt defenses as, uh, you know, it's very much like building the airplane while we fly it. Uh, it's quite a, a challenging time. 
Okay, thanks. Um, one of the questions um, that is up here, rolling here, uh, has to do with the, the safety and security of transferring funds from one bank to another bank online. Uh, how much risk is there in that? And I guess I would send that to Scott. Well, the the banking system, uh, and actually we have been working with the financial sector information sharing and analysis uh, center, FSI SAC, for a number of years now. Um, I will say the banks, you know, view uh, the threats and, and disappearing money. Uh, as an as an extreme threat, and they are highly mobilized uh, to sort of help defend in that space. I, I mean, in my personal life, I can tell you that I get more contact from my credit card company than I've ever imagined based on, was this a good charge or a bad charge? Was this fraudulent or not? So I can firsthand attest to how vigilant the financial sector uh, is here, but there's a lot of money in the world. And uh, so from a, a cyber criminal perspective, the target is, uh, is worth it and the attacks will continue. Um, in general, you know, the safety of the simple wire transfer, I think is pretty good. The bigger challenges is uh, deception with bogus emails trying to instruct a trusted employee to do something wrong, uh, you know, through uh, by trickery. So, my two cents. All right, uh, we are almost at the end of our time, um, so I'm actually going to ask all three of you the same question, right? Which is uh, Back to everyone just looking for their best advice on how often to change passwords. Stu, you spoke about the importance of it, but if we had to ask each one of you how often you were changing your passwords, what would you tell everybody? So let's start with Stu. So we, we at the lab here, we, we um, try and get everybody to change their passwords every 90 days. Um, that seems like a good rotation. And as I said, don't have the same password for different services. Keep a different one keep, keep, uh, for from your banking, from what you use to watch online videos. Scott? Um, 90 days is a great rule of thumb. The only extra thing I would say is it's somewhat application dependent for your personal life, right? So if you're going to take a break from using Facebook for a while, uh, that decision, that day, it's a great time to possibly change your password as you uh, start using or, you know, start choosing to not use uh, passwords. It's a, it's a great time to possibly make changes. Thanks. Roland, the last word's going to come from you. I'm going to give a slightly uh, different response, uh, not about time, but about Please use a password manager. Use a diverse set of passwords that you change probably every six months. And I would sign up for, there's a site called Have I Been Pwned, P-W-N-E-D, which will let you know if your email address has popped up in any data breaches. Well, that's great advice. Okay, so we've come to the end of the forum, but before we all sign off, I'd like to thank Stu Hane, Scott Pinkerton, Roland Varialli for their remarks, their presentations, and their advice to everybody. I'd also like to thank each of you, the members of our audience, for attending and for your very thoughtful questions. The event was recorded, and we will email a link to you tomorrow so that you can listen to it again or share it with your colleagues, your friends, your family. Our next Out Loud lecture will be held on December 10th, so mark your calendars and look for an email invitation with additional details. We hope you enjoyed your virtual visit with Argonne this evening. Stay safe and have a good night.